Hi, GDR here on a beautiful night in beautiful Jamaica. I've got some of your questions. I'm going to try to get through them as quickly as I can because right behind me is my studio where I do most of my recording and that's calling me loud. Uh, can you hear that? That's the studio calling me to go back and finish the next track. All right, first question that came in, and by the way, the great questions, <laughs> love you guys. You're, you're sort of twisting my brain a bit with this. I come out of the studio thinking, oh, I'm going to chill out. And then I see your question, it's like, oh, okay, hang on. One really difficult question, the first one that we got here is, um, a question about the relationship, if I think I, I've interpreted it correctly, what this person is asking, what you're asking, is um, the relationship between, say, gangsters in the time that I was there in the 80s in Bombay, Bollywood, um, and so on, and then the influence that perhaps one had on the other, and then that this had on society with young gangsters. Number one, I don't know enough about Bollywood to comment anything about it. I can only say that I've met a lot of people who work in the Bollywood film industry and I haven't met anyone in that film industry who isn't um, charming, kind, who, for me anyway, charming, kind, cooperative, um, and um, the, it's probably the nicest film industry that I've ever seen and worked in is the Bollywood film industry. That's not saying that there aren't elements of difficulty and that all sorts of problems that happen from time to time here and there. But the industry itself, from my experience, is a, a very good industry filled with tremendously talented people. So that's all I can say from my experience. So I don't know what the influence there is on Bollywood or what Bollywood has on the society. That's not really my area. I can only just say this. Crime, it has a negative effect on everyone around it. The people who perpetrate it, they're usually the first victim of every crime is the person who commits it. They're usually coming from some kind of messed up background. I didn't have that excuse. I've committed a crime out of weakness of my character, but many, many men I met in prison were coming from tremendously deprived backgrounds as children and were catapulted into this life of crime. So yes, they're probably the first one is the first victim, is the one who commits it, then there's a chain of victims after that, from the in, in, individual person who is a victim through to family members on both sides, and this, this can go on for generations. Crime itself is negative for everybody, and everybody knows this, except people who profit from it. So that's my general comment on that. Okay, next question. Um, this was about knowledge and uh, Carter Bai, and you know how he was sharing knowledge with the character Lin. Remember, there is no Carter Bai, I invented him, and there is no Lin, I invented him as well. It's not me, it's a character. Uh, the knowledge that, and the question is where did he get it from, and, and so on, and how useful is it? Uh, um, that's a really good question, because if you're a serious writer, you can't just put what you think and what you believe personally in the mouths of your characters and have them spout that off. It means your characters are really just a Trojan horse that you're going to pack in your message through them. They're not authentic as characters. They need, they need to say things that you as a writer disagree with because that's authentic to that character. It's not authentic to you as a writer. It's not something you agree with. So if I create a character like Carter by and I fill that character with elements of knowledge, as a writer myself, I may not necessarily agree. Another, with everything Carter Bai says, even though I'm giving him the dialogue, if, you know what I, if, you, if I'm making that clear. There's a distinction between what you fill that character with and who you are as a writer. And if you lose that distance between yourself and your world of created characters, you're in a little bit of a trouble. You're starting to get character identification. So you sort of pull back. You are the creator of this world, but you are not in that world. You're a writer, so you're stepping outside. So Carter Bai was a receptacle of bunches of bits and pieces of wisdom I'd gathered along the way. And he does say things and do things that I don't agree with. Um, in The Mountain Shadow, there is a sage, a great teacher called Idris, who comes along. He was Carter Bai's teacher, the one that, it, that Carter Bai studied with. And in The Mountain Shadow, he gets a full reign. He gets pages and pages of things that he says. As a writer, I don't agree with every one of them. The character... Um, they are authentic to that character. They are what that character does believe, if, you, if you're getting me there. So Kadabai was a collection of wisdoms that I got from all over the place, and that's what you do as a writer. Collect your wisdoms. Keep, however you keep it digitally on your phone, you keep it in a Cardex file, you keep it in whatever, a diary, but keep the, and collect those wisdoms you gather. Wisdoms are not there um, to be heard once and then gather dust. 
wisdoms are to be shared. So you as a writer start collecting your wisdoms, put them in a file, and when you get the right opportunity, share it. In a let a character have, say that wisdom, and not you, the writer who's telling the story. Give those wisdoms to your characters. Let your characters say some of the best lines, if you know what I mean. So that's what was happening with Cardiff. I hope that answers that. All right, now we've got a really interesting question about rewrites. And it's a nice, polite, sweet question about why do that so many times? Why rewrite something 20 times? For me, the art is in the draft. This is an artist splashing paint on a canvas. This is a musician punching out chords until, whoa, 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 these are the ones that work, and then getting softly into that and developing a melody. This is um, an, uh, uh, the first fury and ecstasy of what you're doing, and it comes out in a splash, and that's your draft. And sometimes you, it's, it's a series of splashes, because it's not only in one shot, but that's where the art is. The craft of writing is in the rewrite. You can s write things in the draft, lines that are ungrammatical, that m don't make sense, that sentences that, are, that have no subject, predicate, or, uh, sub sorry, subject, object, predicate, that are not following the rules there. In your rewrite, you're going to consider every single one of those because that's where the craft of writing comes out. And you will say, you may think to yourself, you know, this is a really inspired little bit there. I'm lucky I got this, but it's not fully developed. And the craft of writing is going to fully develop that. It'll give it, say, cadence. It'll give it rhythm. It'll give it some poetry. It'll give it something. The craft of writing will embellish that initial draft. So for me, the art is in the draft and the craft is in the rewrite. Okay? So that's why rewrites are important. Now, we've got another one. Oh, yes. Um, a question about how I feel about Charlie Hunnam in the part. I mean, I love Charlie anyway, whether he's in the part or not in the part. He's a fantastic actor, terrific young man, truly inspiring young man. He has every intensity in his art. He's focused on becoming better and better and better at what he does. But he also develops his spiritual side um, tremendously. He allows time and focus for that inner person to develop. That's to go back and connect with nature, to reconnect with the source from which we came. This planet made us. We were born of the same stuff. It's like everything else on this planet. And planet is our mother. To reconnect with mother is something he does in a tremendously disciplined and spiritual way. He's a truly inspiring young man in every way. And I love Charlie. I think he's going to do a fantastic job in Shantaram. All right, I hope that answers that one with Charlie. I do get asked that a lot, and there's like a note to excuse me, Charlie Hunnam. Of course, he's going to be great. Um, okay, now we have a question about um, Carla saying one of the surest ways that you can, you know, um, ruin your life, whatever, is to put all your tr trust in, in someone. And the person says, why, why would you say this, and why would you think this, and, and so on. And you seem to have a much more benign um, outlook on life. It's a good question because, once again, it brings you to the writer who's creating a character and the character who says things that the writer might not agree with. Frankly, I don't agree with that. When Carla says, the truth is a bully we all pretend to like, when Carla says that, she's being Carla, she's being sassy, it's funny, it's kind of biting and witty. Do I agree with that? No. The truth is an absolute. It has a purity beyond material measure. So I don't agree with Carla, but I'll give Carla that line because that is Carla's line. And when I'm inhabiting the character of Carla and thinking her through, her lines come to me. This is her outlook on life. This is the way she looks at things. She says, from her perspective, she's a little, she's cynical. She says, religion is like a long competition to see who can design the silliest hat. That's Carla. Do I agree with that? Of course not. I can pray in four different religions. Of course, I don't believe that as a writer. But the character is commensurate with that character. So when Carla says that, that's not me. But it's fully commensurate with her outlook on life and her way of experiencing the world. Um, this is good, by the way. Thank you. Because I think in answering your questions, there are things here for anyone who's getting started in writing who's developing their writing craft, their writing art, their, all of their aspects of being a writer and exploring it. In answering some of these questions, we're going to get some data on that, I think, as well. I'm going to try and power through some of these because uh, I know I'm taking way too long. Uh, okay, now we've got... Um, 
Oh, uh, well, we've got about ca different characters in the book. Are they real? No. See, um, in life, you, as I, I think I touched on this once in one of the, one of the um, podcasts about this. J let's think about this. A, what is a character? Uh, a character is, there's, it's, it's ink on paper. When you pick the book up, there's nothing there except ink on paper. That's it. The ink is arranged in sequences that allow you to create the character. There's no picture. There's ink on paper. That's it. Words. So what is that character? And how is that character real? Why do we think a character might be real? Why do we ask? Is that character in that book real? When on the front of the book, every book, it says a novel which by definition means they're all fictional characters. It's fiction, a work of fiction, and I, I hope an enjoyable one. So, okay, uh, what is a character? A char you can take a person from life and put them into a story, and sometimes writers have done that to great effect because it was someone they knew well, someone everyone loved, and they said, I'm going to put you in a story, and they said, go ahead and do it. And it worked very well because people who read the story thought it was really funny. F. Scott Fitzgerald did it once. So the thing is, um, characters can be real people in this world, but that's really a kind of photography in writing art. It isn't the actual generation of a character from your own imagination with all their flaws and all their glories. That kind of character, if you think about it, what does the word mean? When we talk about the phrase, when we hear the phrase, it echoes within us the content of someone's character. We know what that means. Character means, in that sense, a set of characteristics by which we can identify a person, by which we can understand them, and upon which we can trust them. A set of char or not, as it turns out, depending on the characteristics. So, characteristics are the things that make character and the kind of character we're talking about here is not two-dimensional drawing it's not a cartoon it's not an invented for five minutes it's a real thing that you're putting on that page if you do that and you follow all of the steps with a rich backstory and with enough reality in, in, in pasted upon that character from things you really know and you've really lived people can have the feeling that they're real even though it says on the front of the book a novel so the characters are not real people, they're all invented characters, and they are there to represent different aspects of our human family. Some are brothers, some are mothers, some are sisters, some are fathers, some are leaders, some are followers. They are there to re represent our human family. And so I hope that answers that one. That's once again a really good question. Okay, um, and uh, these are, I mean, there's even harder ones coming up, my God. <laughs> Yo, I gotta go back to the studio. There'll be more coming in part two soon. GDR out. Blessings of love from Jamaica.